good morning. It's so good to see you in the house of the Lord. I'm going to invite you to stand this morning. We're going to lift up praises to our Heavenly Father, Father, to our Creator God, to our Lord and Savior. He is the reason we're here this morning. We're here to lift up praises to His name. Let's sing together 10,000 Reasons. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me. Let me be singing when the evening comes. Let's sing, bless the Lord. Yes. 
Amen. Good singing by the church this morning, and uh, let me just say welcome to the church family. It's so good to see you in the house of the Lord today, and we also want to say greetings to uh, those that are visiting with us this morning. We certainly are honored by your choosing to come and being in this place of worship, and we certainly count that a, a great honor. I want the church family to take a real close look. You'll notice I'm wearing a lot of blue today. And uh, in honor of those wildcats that are playing uh, this afternoon, uh, there is one decor here that I thought if I don't wear it this weekend, I may not be able to wear it next weekend. But uh, all I'm going to say to you wildcat fans, go and do thou likewise today. All right? So anyway, anyway, had to get that out there because I don't get to do this often, especially this year. But anyway, we're welcoming you and uh, the Lord bless you and your family. Uh, this is our time to pause and pray, and let me share with you a few matters that uh, need attention. Uh, we want to especially be in prayer for uh, Miss Debbie Dispinetti. Uh, this is uh, Tasha's grandmother, and she is having a very uh, serious procedure on Tuesday, uh, cancer surgery, in which they will be removing uh, one of her lungs, and so it will be a very long procedure. And so pray for her and her family. And then uh, also be in prayer for Matt Greenlee. Uh, Matt will be heading home from a long uh, time in Panama. He'll be heading home on Wednesday. So let's keep him in prayer that he arrives back safely. Pray for the team that is there now. They are wrapping up, finishing the, uh, the building of a home for the missionaries that live uh, in that area. And then we also want to rejoice. Uh, we prayed last Sunday for Matt and Mariah, and they are home, and Coulter is home and doing well. And so I know the family appreciates uh, your prayers over the past week for them, and uh, we just rejoice with them today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this time that we can pause in our worship we rejoice in the fact that we do stand on holy ground because we knew that and we know that it was the blood of Christ uh, that was shed for us that makes it possible that we can approach you today. And I pray for every person in this room that has experienced the redeeming work of Christ, who have, have experienced the forgiveness of sins as they have placed their trust in Jesus Christ alone, that as we approach your throne, we do it with that in mind but we do come boldly as Jesus commanded. And Father, we bring special prayers and requests today. We ask for great grace to be given to Debbie as she faces this major surgery. May she experience great peace. May you just guard and protect her, be with her family. Lord, we pray for Matt, that you'll guide him as he wraps up the work that uh, he's been leading, help them to finish up the job and we pray for Matt's safety as he travels home. And then, Lord, how we rejoice in the birth of Coulter. Bless Matt and Mariah. Give them wisdom and grace, Lord, as they experience this newfound joy and also this overwhelming sense of responsibility. Uh, may you guide them and bless them. And then, Father, I realize there are some unspoken matters here in this place, matters that are very heavy on the heart of the person or the families, I pray that you'll help us and help them to be able to cast all of their cares upon you, trusting that, Lord, uh, you're able. You're the God that gives grace, and strength, and help in time of need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to stand once again. We're going to sing, His mercy is more. Sing praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Sing what love could remember what wrongs we have done.
would wait as we constantly roam. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the
Good morning. Uh, last night we went to uh, Winter Jam, uh, so if you see any of the youth that are maybe dozing off, we didn't get back till a little after one or so, or a little before one. So if you if you pinch them, don't don't pinch them too hard if they're <laughs> nodding off. Our uh, our scripture reading this morning is found in Mark chapter six, verses fourteen through twenty-nine, and it says, "King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known." Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah, and, others, and still others claimed he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in a prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, Ask me for anything you want, and I will give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, Whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried in uh, to give to the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in the tomb. May God bless the reading of his word. One day we'll be free, free indeed. 
Jesus. One day all the struggle will cease. And we will see your glory revealed on that day. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we We'll sing and shout the victory. Let's sing that again this morning. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing.
thank the Lord for Brother Ronnie and uh, the blessing of his ministry through song and uh, how he blesses our church family so often. Our text is Mark chapter 6 this morning, and we will be looking at verses 14 through 29. And we've entitled the message before us, Faithful Unto Death. We are brought into a moment in which we have a little flashback. Um, Mark, and as the Lord has led him in writing of this gospel, we have this unique encounter, this unique moment where word has spread throughout the land, uh, word about Jesus, about the things that he was doing, the things that he was saying. It was having such an impact that even the leaders of that day took notice. And Herod, who is called here King Herod, uh, he was the tetrarch or leader of a fourth of the kingdom at the time. And word has come to him concerning this one called Jesus. And it says in verse 14, King Herod heard. He heard of him. He heard about Christ. And all of a sudden, his conscience begins to convict him. He is convicted of the fact that he had taken an innocent man and imprisoned him, had allowed this innocent man to be uh, brutally killed by beheading. And when he hears what Jesus is saying and doing, he immediately assumes that it has to be John the Baptist. It has to be the one that he had allowed this to take place. And then after that, Mark goes back. He flashes back to this occasion. And as we look at this section of Scripture, we watch or observe the life of this man, John the Baptist. So I guess you could say that our sermon is more of a biographical sermon on the life of John the Baptist. Now, he was quite a character. Uh, He was quite an interesting prophet and preacher. As you know, his ministry was out in the middle of nowhere, out in the wilderness. The Bible tells us some things about John the Baptist, the way he dressed and what he ate and, uh, and how he preached. And so he was a very unique man who had been called of God. And as we look at his life today, my hope and intent of this message is to challenge all of us to determine, I want to be faithful unto death. I want to be found faithful to the Lord until I breathe my last breath. You know, 1 Corinthians 4.2 says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And that ought to be the desire of every one of us, is that I want to be faithful to the Lord. And I want to hear those words when I die and stand before God when He would say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now, we can. (laughs) We can be faithful to the Lord. It's not an impossibility. And I want you to note with me some of the things about this man that I believe will motivate us concerning being faithful. The first thing that we note as we see the response of King Herod is that John the Baptist was no no doubt faithful to his model. He was faithful to his model. Now, who was his model? Well, Jesus. He followed Christ. He followed the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was so faithful to Jesus that when King Herod hears what Jesus is doing and the things that Jesus is saying, he immediately says, it's John the Baptist. (laughs) John the Baptist has risen from the dead. But those around him said, no, it's Elijah who has come, as it was prophesied. Others said, no, it's a prophet. He's a prophet. He's like the prophets. But verse 16, Herod was insistent. He said, no, this is John, whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. Now, I tell you, when I read that, my desire is that I hope and I pray 
that I will so live for Christ that others will see Jesus in me. You know, that's what the song says, isn't it? Let others see Jesus in you. That ought to be our motivation. In this life, it ought to be our motivation and our desire is that we are found faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. That when people hear us talk and when they watch the way we live and when they note how we handle things, that they think of Jesus, that they think of our Savior. And they can. And here was a man who was guilt-ridden, conscience was disturbing him, and when he hears about Jesus, he thinks of John the Baptist. And I pray that would be true of us, that we would so live for Christ that others would recognize that and would see him in us. I remember the story about Dr. Adrian Rogers, who was a longtime pastor at Bellevue Baptist in Memphis. And Dr. Rogers was, was just a, a phenomenal man of God. And he never, ever preached the word without giving people an opportunity to respond. He believed that if you preached it, you ought to give people an invitation. He believed that choice ought to be made when the word of God is preached and taught. But when he would go to give the invitation, many times it would be this simple. He would just say, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come unto Jesus. <laughs> well, one day he was walking across the campus there on the church grounds, and a little kindergarten girl was out there, and, and she saw Dr. Rogers walking across the campus. And she yelled out, hello, Jesus. <laughs> and Dr. Rogers looked around like, who in the world is she talking about? And he realized what it was. That little girl, week after week after week, saw that man who preached about Jesus, who loved Jesus. And when he would stand to say, come unto Jesus, she just assumed that must be Jesus. <laughs> because that man lives like Jesus, he talks like Jesus, he acts like Jesus, and she thought, this must be Jesus. I want to tell you, I wish people would misidentify who we are as a Christian, and they would think, there's Jesus. <laughs> a lost world would see Jesus in us. Here was a man that was faithful to his model. But number two, he was also faithful in his mission. The Bible tells us here in this passage of Scripture that John the Baptist, uh, we know, had a, a great impact on that world and society when he was living. And he was called to be the forerunner. Over in Matthew chapter 11, we're not going to turn there, verses 1 through 11, we see that, John, uh, that Matthew identifies and John identifies himself as the forerunner of the Messiah. He realized that his job was to prepare the way for the one that was coming, to prepare the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he did it well. He did it well. You know, I admire this man. He was a man that was content with the ministry God called him to. His ministry was not to the city lights. His ministry was to the starlights out in the wilderness. He went out into the wilderness area, and the people came by the droves. I mean, from the wealthy to the poor, to the military, to the non, to the religious leaders, to the un irreligious leaders. They came out there to hear this man preaching out in the wilderness. And his message, according to the Scripture, was that he preached to them that they should repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He was preparing the way for the Messiah. He was content with his calling. He was so content that he even was content to say that I must decrease and Jesus must increase. I tell you, that's the kind of attitude we ought to have when we follow Christ. Our mission is to be all about him. Our mission is to prepare the way. I want to tell you, John the Baptist's job was to prepare the way for him coming the first time. We've been left here to prepare the way for him coming the second time. He's coming again. And you have been called as a witness of Christ, as a follower of Christ, to prepare the way of the one who is coming again. We ought to so live like our master that when others hear us and see us, that they want what we have. They want to know the one that we represent. And we are preparing them for the fact that he's coming again and they must make preparation before he comes again. Here was a man content in his mission. You know, there was an old uh, missionary who stated that his goal in life 
was to so live for Christ, to so love Christ, to so make Christ known that when he died, no one would remember him at all. But they would remember Jesus. Man, do, do we have that kind of attitude? Do we have the attitude that nothing about me? I want to die. I just want Christ to so live through me that folks, they don't remember me, but they remember him. That was John the Baptist. Faithful in his mission. But number three, he was faithful to the message. He was faithful to the message. In verse 17, it says, For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Now, what happened? Well, here is this tetrarch, this king who was married, divorced his wife, and ended up taking the wife uh, of his brother, Philip. Here he's married a woman that was his sister-in-law, who was also his niece, who became his wife. And John the Baptist, when he heard what he had done, immediately went to him and preached to him and told him that this was wrong, that it was against the law of God. According to Leviticus uh, chapter 18 and 16 and chapter 20 and 21, it had clear, clear command that what he did was against the law of God. And John the Baptist called him out on it. He went and confronted this high-ranking leader, this prominent man, and said, what you have done has brought sin to the nation. He called him out on a matter that was opposed to what God's holy word had taught. And I want to tell you, that took a lot of guts. It cost him a lot because eventually he was arrested. He was placed in prison, and we know the rest of the story. But he did not let the place or the prominence or the power that existed in that day to silence him. He stood firmly. He stood firmly in the message. Man, when he was out in the wilderness, he preached the same message to the poor folks and to the individuals that were nobody. And he preached that same message to them, and he preached that same message to the Pharisees, the religious of the day, uh, the military that would come out and hear him preach. He never wavered in the message that God had called him to preach. Now, what was that message? Well, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, that he preached to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his message. Repent, repent, repent. Why did he preach that message? Because that was the message Jesus preached. Matthew 4, 17 said that from that time forward, Jesus preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We, lead, we see the life of Paul, who later on uh, is ministering uh, for Christ. And what was his message? It says in the book of Acts that he was testifying to both Jews and Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Here are these men, John the Baptist, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul. The message was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it mattered not who it was. It mattered not. He never wavered from his message. He preached, repent. Why did John the Baptist preach repentance? Why did Jesus preach repentance? Why did Paul preach repentance? Because they recognized that the greatest danger to humanity is sin. That's why they preached it. That's why they preached it. And John was not afraid to go and confront the leader of his day. He was not afraid to confront the political power of his day. And I want to tell you something, folks. What that teaches us is that there is no separation of church and state. The church ought to be putting its nose in the state's business. The state has no business putting its nose in the church business. But we have an obligation to hold our leaders accountable for decisions that they make. On the local level, on the state level, on the national level. 
We ought to be like John the Baptist who stood firm in his day against the high-ranking officials of that day because the things they did and the way they lived brought sin into the land because they had perverted the Word of God. John saw the necessity of character in the leaders of that day. I want to tell you something, folks. We've got to quit having more allegiance to our political party than we do the Word of God. Now, I'm speaking to all, Democrat, Republican, Independent. We've got to quit having allegiance to our particular political party over the Word of God. We've got to take that stand. We have to speak truth out. We have to hold our leaders accountable for their decisions and actions. Folks, that's what John the Baptist was doing. He was saying, you must repent. What does that mean? It means stop what you've been doing. Repent. Lord, I'm sorry. I was wrong. I have sinned. And you stop. That's what repentance is. I want to tell you, repentance in the average Baptist church is, is that we cry crocodile tears over something we've done because we feel guilty, and then we get up and go do the same thing the next day. That's pretty much the extent of the Christian life today. My conscience bothered me. Oh, I feel guilty about this. And we have one of these so-called experiential type things that happen, and then we write back at it the next day. Repentance means that we say, this is wrong, and I must stop. Folks, we need that. Here was a man that was faithful to the message, and folks, we need to be faithful to the same message. We must hold ourselves accountable. We must repent. Folks, that means we need to get honest. We need to get specific. We need to recognize that God takes sin seriously, and we ought to take sin seriously also. That means that when we're guilty of drunkenness, we ought to repent of it and never do it again. That means when we're taking illegal drugs, we ought to repent of it and stop doing it. That means if you're in an adulterous relationship, you ought to repent of it and don't do it again. That means as a young man, if you're looking at things on your phone and computer that is causing you to have lust in your heart and mind, you should repent of it and don't do it again. It means that if you're tempted to leave your spouse underground that don't have any biblical precedence and divorce them, you ought to repent of it and don't do it again. It means that if you've had an abortion, you admit that it was wrong and you repent of it and you don't do it again. It means if you're thinking that you're a boy when you're a girl or you're a girl when you're a boy, you should repent of it and not think that away again. If you're attracted to someone of the same sex, you ought to repent of it and don't do it again. That's repentance. But we're afraid to say it today. Oh, you're getting into political realms. Oh, you're talking about abortion. Oh, you're talking about same-sex marriage. Oh, you're talking about gender identity. Oh, you're talking about things that are political. No, they're not. They're moral. They're biblical. And John the Baptist did not back down to go and confront the leaders of his day and say, you are in sin. You need to repent. From the highest to the lowest, that is the message that we need to hear today, folks. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I want to tell you, here is the consequences of when we heed that message. We experience cleansing. We experience forgiveness. We experience newness. We experience a restoration of our joy. We experience a new understanding of our purpose and plan. We experience a sweet walk with the one who died for us. We have allowed sin to become a hedge and it has become a deal breaker in our relationship with Christ. It has become a a joy killer in our relationship with Christ. And we need some John the Baptist that will stand again. We need some Jesus type preaching that will speak it again. We need some Paul type preaching that says that. Man, folks, if you have a problem with repentance, you've got a problem with Jesus. That was his message. That was his message. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. He was faithful to the message. But then also he was faithful in his manner of life. Verse 20 says, For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. I want to tell you something about John. John was the same man in private as he was in public. When Herod went and had one-on-one encounter 
John didn't say, now listen here, you know, I have my public ministry life, and I've got to maintain a certain reputation out there. But you know, man to man, let's just talk about it. You know, maybe this isn't so bad. That wasn't John the Baptist. In his private time, and his personal time, he was the same. Let me ask you, are you the same when you're alone as you are here in this room? Are you the same when you're off somewhere in another state, nobody's around, you're off on whatever trip you're on, and nobody, nobody is around? Are you the same person there as you are here when you're home with your family or with your church family? Because John the Baptist was a man who was righteous, he was holy, he was upright in his manner of life. And folks, that causes me to stop and say, Brad, are the thing that you're doing, the things that you're saying, are they enhancing your witness or are they hindering your witness? We ought to be honest enough to ask ourselves that question. John the Baptist was faithful in his manner of life. Then number five, he was faithful in his misfortune. Here's a man, it says in verses 19 through 28, that was in prison illegally. Here was a woman, Herodias, that had been scorned. I mean, when he preached against what they had done, Herod kind of like, kind of at least took it in. Woo, Herodias, she didn't take it in. She was mad. She was scorned. She held it in her heart. She was looking for the opportune moment. She didn't have the, the power to do what she wanted to do. She had the will, and she was constantly scheming, constantly finding a way, an opportune moment. And here was a woman that was so low that she sent her daughter in there to do an illicit dance among all of these men and secure the favor of Herod to give her whatever she wanted. The Bible tells us that before, when she went to ask of her mother, it says, so she went out and said to her mother... What shall I ask? That tense of that phrase is in a tense that means she was really thinking hard about what she really wanted. But Mama said, no, this is what you're getting. <laughs> I want John the Baptist's head on a bladder, platter. And so what happened? She came in with haste and said, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. John the Baptist, he had been faithful to the Lord. He had been a faithful forerunner. He was faithful to his message. He was faithful in his manner of living. He was faithful to his example. But now he was facing misfortune. He's in prison for doing right. He was in prison. I want to tell you, number one, folks, if you're serious about following Christ, if you're serious about uplifting and upholding his message, it'll cost you something. It'll cost you something. But I tell you what, it is a cost that's worth being paid because... The ramifications and repercussions of being faithful to Christ are so, so blessed. That here was a man that faced misfortune. And we don't find him wallowing in pity. We don't find him whining. We don't find him saying, why me? We don't find him saying, you know, uh, this isn't fair. He was a man that stayed faithful even while in prison. And because of his faithfulness, he lost his head. He lost his head because of his faithfulness. But Herod and Herodias lost their soul because of their sin. Folks, I want to tell you, there will be misfortune that will come to us when we live for Christ. It's not going to always be easy. There will be challenges, there will be costs, and there will be repercussions for standing for Christ. But even though things weren't going well, he stayed faithful. And then last of all, he was faithful in his memory. Jesus was asked about him on an occasion where John was working out all of these things happening in his mind. He sent his disciples to say, go and ask Jesus, are you the one? Are you the one that we're waiting on? And Jesus sent back word to comfort him. Go and tell him what I've been doing. Go and tell him what I've been saying. And then when they left, Jesus said this of him. He said, there's not a greater man that has ever lived than John the Baptist. But even in his death, he is still speaking for us. Even in his death, we are lauding his faithfulness. Today, we look at his life. He's been dead years and years and years. But today, we remember him. He's been faithful in his memory. I want to tell you, I pray... That will be our motivation 
in the days we have. Lord, I want to so live for you that all they remember is you when I'm gone. But when they do remember me, they remember you. That was John the Baptist. Faithful. Faithful unto death. You know, when you look at the closing of this passage, it's interesting to see the parallel. Here we have a man, John the Baptist, that was executed by the secular rulers of his day. And it was really just foretelling what was going to happen to Jesus. You know, he was the forerunner. He not only was a forerunner by his message, but he was also a forerunner by the way that he died. And just as John the Baptist was executed by the secular rulers, we know that just a few years later, Jesus is going to be executed by the secular rulers of the day. Just as here Herod gave in to his wife Herodias' demands, we know that eventually Jesus would stand before Herod and Pilate, and they too would give in to the pressures of that day. Just as Herodias held within her heart bitterness, and envy, and anger because of what he said, we know that the chief priests of that day schemed and planned to find a way to pull the Lord Jesus Christ down. But then in the end, verse 29 said, The disciples heard of it. They came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb. And we know the same thing happened to our Savior. As Joseph of Arimathea went and asked permission for the body of Jesus and took it down and placed it in his own hewn tomb. Here we have a reminder of what Christ has done for us. And John the Baptist setting the example, pacing the way, preparing the way for our Lord in his life and in his death. This morning, I want to encourage you. We may face opposition like John the Baptist. There are costs involved in following Christ. But I want to remind you, none of that will thwart the kingdom of heaven. God is going to accomplish all that he planned. Folks, we are on the winning team. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I would rather be on the side where punishment and pain comes and be on the winning team than be on the side where there is no pain and know that I have an eternity to face separated from the God that created me. This morning, if you're here and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to come to realize at what cost he made on your behalf. He died for your sins. He died for your sins, sins that you, because of what he's done, can acknowledge them, repent of them, and be forgiven. It's all because of Christ. You can be made whole. You can be made clean. That void that you have inside of you, that you've tried to fill it with everything imaginable to try to fill that emptiness, only Christ can fill it. Only Christ can fill it. And He has made a way that you can be saved. And today I would say to you, just like Dr. Rogers said so many times, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come and give Him your life today. Come and trust Him. Come and place your faith in Him alone to be your Lord and Savior. And then to the child of God here today, you say, Brother Brad, I've been playing games with my salvation. I've been playing games with sin. I've not taken it seriously. I've rationalized and I've reasoned it out, and it has left me none the better. What do you need to do? You need to do exactly what John said. You need to do what Jesus said. You need to do what Paul said. Repent. 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 Have a change of mind. Acknowledge that it's wrong. Repent of it and determine with God's help, I'm not doing that again. I'm not going down that pathway again. And you may need to come and say, today I need to rededicate my life to Christ. I need to renew the commitment that I made to Him. I have let sin become a wedge between me and my Lord. And I need to be cleansed. I need a, to be totally cleansed by Him of this sin that I've let dominate my life. And He will. As we sing, we invite you to come. Come to Jesus. Come and make things right with Him. As we stand, as we sing, you come.